Um, I think we've come to the end of talks, but we do have time for a discussion panel. Um, I just want to mention that there are there is another talk going on, um, but we can discuss a few issues. If uh, you have questions uh, specific to any um, anyone before, so you can raise a question and ask the person directly if that's okay. Um, if not, yes, uh, Dan, go ahead. Uh, is Tanya still about? <clears throat> Tanya. Um, oh, we'll... Yes, I am. Oh, Tanya, Dan, I just had a couple of questions to ask you, if that's okay. Sure. Um, I guess I'm a little bit interested to know what are the uh, natural hosts for Trisulcus mitsukurii in Australia, because it's it's already exists here, I gather. It, well, what's unsure is whether it was brought in or not um, when with the old Chinese trade. Um, it supposedly does do something to, and it was intentionally brought in as well to control the green veggie bug, the Zara virigula. Virigula, yeah. Problem is we don't think that it actually does very much with Nazara. The other problem is that this beast is minuscule. So <laughs> since it's been brought in, whether it does anything or not, no one really knows to be perfectly honest. Um, so even going out and sampling now, it's very difficult to find egg masses. Um, so we actually don't know where it is. Oh, I, I guess. <laughs> well, maybe that leads to my second question. <clears throat> you mentioned, I think, that in the Mediterranean, both uh, Trisocla species occur, as does brown marmorated stink bug. Is there any evidence to suggest that the, the two par egg parasitoids have any suppressing effect on populations of, of um, BMSB in, in that part of the world or other parts of the world where they coexist? Um, I think the short answer is unknown. BMSB is still spreading throughout Europe. So to notice any control effect is at this point still very early. I think the two Trisoka species were only found in about 2018. Now, having said that, New Zealand has already pre-approved and approved has a pre-approval to bring in Japonicus to New Zealand when BMSB ultimately gets there because they're figuring it is going to get here, uh, which is why we would probably end up with Japonicus as well. How effective they are in Europe or even in America, we don't know. We know that they do parasitize, but obviously BMSB is still spreading. So no, it has not solved the situation, if you like. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, quick question uh, as a follow up. Since we are expecting Japonicus to arrive, um, any idea how it's going to impact the native Pentatomidae? Since it has a very wide host range, um, is that something we should prepare for as well? Since we're preparing for the arrival of um, the brown mammarade stink bug with its biological control with this natural enemy, which could have an yeah. impact on our native pentatonity? I, the short answer is we do know that it will attack other things. So New Zealand, mm. for example, have done choice tests and yes, it attacks. Um, well, New Zealand don't have a lot of native pentatomids. I think they've got introduced ones. Mm. So it does attack some in America, whether it will attack, we have a lot more pentatomids here, it is highly possible that it will. The problem is going to be preventing it getting here, if yeah. you like. It, again, it is minuscule. It arrived in both America and Europe. It wasn't imported there. It did it on its own. It hitchhiked mm -hmm. somehow. So the concern obviously is that yes, it will get here yeah. and how to prepare for its arrival <laughs> Yeah. It is not is going it, to be straightforward. I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say, is it a justification to um, just test it anyway to see what, what impact it might have, just instead of just waiting for it to get here? I suspect that some of that work is going to happen. Yeah. Uh, probably closer, you know, from now, now that we know that, yes, it obviously can get here, we will use studies from New Zealand and elsewhere mm. and base them on that. Yeah. I suspect 
suspect by and large, because my role in this project was purely the modeling, mm -hmm. I suspect that it's a case of funding and how seriously that issue is taken. So BMSB, everyone is concerned about. Um, it has been intercepted previously. In fact, if I remember correctly, even a GBIF record said it occurred here. Um, it's funding. All right. Uh, Ari has a question. Go on, Harry. Yeah, I've got a question for Hark. I'm just, you know, he obviously demonstrated, you know, you demonstrated some really nice learning, associative learning in lab tests. And I'm always curious, particularly in parasitoids, how much impact it has on the field conditions. And, um, you know, you had a situation where clearly the learning could override the innate preference of the parasitoid. How do you actually, how do you actually test the impact of that sort of behavior in a field context? And has, any, and has anyone done that properly, do you think? Mm. I think it's a little study in the Netherlands. They why they start to want to do that is because they found that there's a lot of um, parasitoid. They try to release release into the field, but it seems like they, their uh, foraging efficiency is not that good. So they just try to think maybe that is a lot of non rewarding um, associative cue might confuse them. But however, they change, they, they, they st uh, start to test them with the new uh, learn order, they still work. They can, they do actually show a really, um, really good flexibility to differentiate the different kind of order. So, and even uh, they can form a, form a memory for those that learn one. So that is why I want to use, uh, use the diagma because it's a quite, it's a quite a phenomenon um, specialist or what to deposit eggs on the DBN. But yeah, so in the field, we haven't tested, but, uh, but as you can see in the, in the JSAS talk, they do actually establish their population quickly in the, within the brassica seasoning happen. Yeah, so I think if in, in the near future, if we can establish their food sources like a nectar plants more, um, around their field, it might um, it might be helpful for their uh, foraging efficiency. Yeah. Um, Huck. Yeah. Is diamond bark moth a, a pest of uh, Chinese cabbage as well? Yeah, they are the really um really uh yeah. There's a can cause a really severe damage on the Chinese cabbage the, rather yeah. than common cabbage because uh, common cabbage when they um, during the harvest time, they become really hardened. Yeah. So diamond and uh, DBN, uh, diamondback moss can really feed on them um, easily better than, than Chinese cabbage. Yeah. So my question is, if um, Chinese cabbage and common cabbage are both um, hosts of the diamondback moth and the parasites are tracking the diamondback moth, and the, the, what makes you think that they will be learning for Chinese cabbage and not for cabbage. What is the difference? Why would it be learning uh, if uh, the parasites yes. track the... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, would, we do have actually ever done the GC moss uh, analysis before to compare the diamondback moss infested um, Chinese cabbage um, between the Debian um, infested common cabbage. But those uh, compounds shows uh, they, they don't have uh, that such a different profile. So the problem is that um, we, we, uh, my, my speculation is that uh, they, they might have a different proportion of the compound makes it, uh, uh, makes it different, even it's subtle, but um, the, the naive was female was, they still can differentiate such a subtle change. Yeah, I think that's what I'm, if, if you are calling them naive, but maybe somewhere they can't track their host, their, the diamond black moth on different brassica, they could, do you think they have the ability to do that? And would they be naive? Yeah, the, the funny thing is that uh, those uh, commercial one, they all reel them on the common cabbage. Yeah. With oh. a BN. However, when we test in the lab, they do actually show the stronger preference the naive one, they do actually show stronger preference for the Chinese cabbage, DBN infested Chinese cabbage. So that is, um, we think maybe the, um, the order from the 
uh, from the cocoon, they probably didn't learn it. So mm -hmm. we call this naive, yeah. <laughs> All right, Thanks. thank you. Um, has anybody got any question for any speakers? Um, I think um, we have five minutes. Um, what I could say is um, there was a very interesting talk, or there was a very interesting discussion between Dan and Angela about what to consider successful biological, con classical biological control. Um, I think um, we could talk about that more if anybody cares. If not, um, we can just move on and have a break. Yeah, I think uh, what uh, what I'm trying to say that Dan raised a very important question when um, Angela was saying that the biological control agent was not successful when clearly it was having an impact. And um, one of the misconceptions is that um, when you use um, biological control agents, they're supposed to eradicate the either the weed or the pests. But in most cases, the intention is to minimize and reduce impact. Uh, Uma, it's Greg Wolfo here from here. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, just following on from that discussion with uh, Dan and Angela, yeah. I'm wondering if there's differences in the expectations of, say, graziers or, or other producers who want to see more immediate um, control yeah. and perhaps national parks where they're never going to have the resources to go in and spray everything out anyway, but population level impacts on the weed over time might yeah. still demonstrate some real benefits in those situations. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. That's interesting. So can I say something here? Yes, please. I, I'm also wondering because the temperature graphs were showing that the um, mealybug had a very narrow temperature range. Yeah. So somewhere like southern Queensland, where it's getting too cold versus further north, where presumably it's doing a bit better, mm -hmm. could be that you may need um, repeated introductions, for example, mm -hmm. at a particular time of year. Yeah. And I imagine that when the climax modeling is done, that you look at the growth chart, it's persisting there, it's surviving, but the population growth there will be very small, will be much smaller than it is elsewhere, which is more suitable. So it will have, you're, you're possibly at the limits of the range. Yeah. So your population will never get to a point where it can, in our eyes, adequately uh, control your uh, cactus. That's right. I think we've actually um, lost Angela, which is a pity because I'm so glad she got a tech issue sorted out because it was quite an interesting talk. So Tanya, I guess you're suggesting also that, um, and it's quite likely that that mealybug might actually be doing a pretty good job in other areas where it's more climatically suited, yeah. even though maybe in that in the Gundawindi area it's uh, it's not quite so effective. But I, I still think that even if it's even if it's reducing the um, the uh, population of that cactus by, you know, a modest percentage. That's still better than not at all, yeah. and should not be not to be discredited somehow. And probably just means that maybe a bit further work with additional biocontrol agents to get a higher level of uh, management. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think that'd be correct. And that when you'd be looking for your next biocontrol agent, that you want something that can tolerate those colder climates to, yeah. you know, be able to increase the effect. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ari Hoffman has a question, go ahead. Bill, I, probably, I probably shouldn't raise this issue because I know you've only got one minute left. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> but I'm, I'm really curious about, you know, following on from this discussion, I'm curious about the stability of these different situations. So where you get partial control as opposed to strong control, you find that it's a more stable situation in the long term. So. Um, I mean, this, this was an issue with cactus blasters, right? Um, so when you get a big hit, then some people have argued that you get more stability, whereas if you get partial suppression, then it can break out again. And I'm just wondering if there's any enough data in this particular context to make a comment about that. Hmm. 
but that probably requires a 30 minute discussion, I suspect. <laughs> but I think, yeah, but I, I just think it's a really, I think it's an intriguing issue. And, um, yeah. and of course, you know, you can think of, you can think of reasons why partial suppression um, mm. could eventually lead to a situation where that suppression is lost, right? Um, yeah. So, so, you know, so the obvious, the obvious analogy is cancer, right? So basically, if you yeah. get a situation where the cancer breaks out, the population size of cells is too big, just like it can be for a pest. And of course, you get the evolutionary change, you get the mutation, and bang, it goes again, right? Yeah. So I'm just, so I'm just wondering about that. But you know, as I say, it's probably a bad timing to answer. Yeah, I think we've, we've come to the end of this. Maybe we can carry this on next uh, to tomorrow in the next discussion yeah. Yeah. panel. I think it's an interesting thing to talk about. All right, um, we'll leave it here and continue tomorrow. Thanks everybody for your participation and thanks the attendance for all the questions and it's been really nice. Um, see you tomorrow. Take care, bye-bye. Big. Bye.